Howdy, it's Mr. Justice. Uh, today we're going to explore how anthropogenic increases of carbon dioxide can impact coral and other marine calcifiers. So let's get started here. All right, so this is review from last time. Uh, take a look through the process of exchange. Carbon dioxide is able to dissolve into ocean water, and when it does that, it reacts with H2O to form H2CO3, carbonic acid. Uh, these H plus ions can uh, dissociate themselves and uh, releasing the carbonate, uh, making that available to uh, those marine calcifiers. Now, what are those? Like this nautilus right here, or the coral, or these phytoplankton. We'll talk more about some of those other marine calcifiers in a moment. But that carbonate ion comes from dissolved carbon dioxide in the ocean. The problem that we've talked about last time is that due to anthropogenic increases of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, right? The burning of fossil fuels, we're increasing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, which means that more CO2 molecules can dissolve into the ocean, making more carbonic acid. That carbonic acid uh, is uh, kind of stealing this carbonate and making less of it available to the coral, the nautilus, and the phytoplankton and those other marine calcifiers. So as a result, this increase in CO2 acidifies the ocean, right? Take a look at the pH here in uh, we're about 8.2, 8.1 or so in the 1800s, and the pH of the seawater is projected to drop to around 7.7 .7 in 2100. Again, that problem is, is that it's going to remove carbonate ions and make fewer of them available to those marine calcifiers. So how else can in, uh, ocean acidification impact biodiversity? Take a look at this coral reef, right? Wonderfully biodiverse here. Think of all of those nooks and crannies that the fish, shrimp, crabs that live in this area can hide in and uh, use it as a habitat or a feeding ground or a breeding ground, right? Now these coral are really interesting uh, individuals here. They're actually uh, take a look at this, right? This is a close-up view of one. They're actually a composite organism, meaning that it's made up of two species of, of organisms, right, in one. Uh, so the polyp, the, the coral polyp itself is a consumer, it's a heterotroph. And so with those tentacles, it's able to bring in, uh, you know, dissolve nutrients into its body. Uh, and use it to grow, right? So that some of its food comes from that, but most of the food actually comes from this other species that lives inside of it. Uh, the zooxanthellae is what they're called. These guys are producers. They're photosynthetic algae that live within inside of the coral polyp itself. And what these zooxanthellae do is photosynthesize. They're able to take in carbonate and fix that carbon into uh, organic compounds, sugars that can be used by the algae, but also by the coral polyp itself. So the, this composite organism is actually a really great example of a symbiotic relationship, specifically mutualism, right? Mutualism is when both of those species benefit from something. Uh, the coral uh, polyp is benefiting from the foods made and produced by the photosynthetic algae. And the photosynthetic algae uh, have a location, to, they have protection from the outside world living inside of the coral polyp. What the coral polyps do is they secrete a calcium, they, they combine carbonate with calcium and make a calcium carbonate uh, skeleton. And let's show you an example of that right here on the screen. Uh, this is my grandmother's coral, uh, pretty wild. It's probably about 80 or 90 years old. I think she found this or got this in Hawaii back in the 1950s when, I, I don't think you were allowed to do that anymore, but uh, yeah, uh, back in the day. So uh, you can kind of see the area where those coral polyps would, it would uh, kind of start to build out that, uh, that calcium carbonate. Uh, skeleton underneath. So they kind of live within here and then you'd imagine then that this entire rock here is being built up by those coral polyps and, uh, and growing out that way covered in tissue with those algae within. Uh, so yeah, like cor coral are going to be impacted then 
by the lack of that carbonate. As the ocean acidifies, less of the materials to make the rock are going to be available. It's not just going to impact coral, it's also going to impact the other organisms that you see here on your screen, right? Like the clams, uh, the coral that you're looking at, crabs, lobsters, barnacles, like the Balenus barnacles that we talked about at the very beginning of class, these phytoplankton, a uh, variety of other organisms, all use calcium carbonate for their main building block in the shells and their skeletons that they produce. Ocean acidification is going to reduce that building block, making them smaller, making them decrease in abundance, and that becomes an issue. Uh, becomes an issue because like all of those organisms are a part of a food web, right? Uh, take a look here at the very base, the bottom of this food web here are microscopic single-celled organisms. This is the plankton that you hear about in the ocean oftentimes. Uh, these guys have names like these coccolithophores here that you see on your screen. These guys are plants, if you can believe it, right? Look at the variety of uh, species here in this picture alone. They're single-celled algae that live within a calcium carbonate shell. So you're looking at a microscopic calcium carbonate kind of shell structure that the organism lives within, and it's impacted by this process by ocean acidification. These guys make up the base of the food web. So if we decrease the, the abundance of this, we can impact all of the other organisms within that uh, food web as well. In addition to these coccolithophores, there are other types of plankton too. There, some of them are called foraminifera. Uh, and you're looking at the uh, picture of these are also single-celled protists and they live within these uh, shells that, again, they produce. Uh, the shells are made of calcium carbonate. Ocean acidification can impact these too. Uh, so, right, take a look. Let's talk a little bit more about the foraminifera. They make up a part of the base of the food web. Um, there are some of the marine calcifiers. That means that they produce a calcium carbonate shell or skeleton. You're looking at pictures of these right here. Uh, they're single-celled organisms that make those calcium carbonate shells, and because the composition of the shells is calcium carbonate, they can be negatively impacted due to ocean acidification. Uh, let's talk about these coccolithophores because they're kind of interesting creatures. These are microscopic uh, images here that you're looking at. They're plants, uh, right? They're the open water plants. There's no soil out there, so there's no way that we can take root in the middle of the ocean. Uh, so, so these guys then are making up the producer side of, of that food web, of that ecosystem. Uh, they're able to uh, photosynthesize. They're producers. They're single-celled algae. Uh, and they're, being, they're, they're an important part of the food web too, right? Because they're plants. Uh, they're the pretty, right? all producers on terrestrial or aquatic ecosystems uh, make up the base of that food pyramid. And these guys do too, even though they are single celled. Uh, they use a calcium carbonate to build what's called a coccolith. And you can see the coccolith here. Coco means hard berry, and lith refers to rock. So it's kind of like this hard berry rock, very small, uh, that lives within these calcium carbonate rocks, essentially, right? Kind of interesting. Uh, they'll be impacted by ocean acidification. And speaking of rocks, like here's something that's interesting about uh, coccolithophores is that they make up this, the, the white cliffs of Dover. Uh, you know what, white cliffs of Dover, it's made up of chalk. That's what calcium carbonate is, CaCO3. Sometimes you find it in antacids like Tums, right? Uh, the, so the white cl uh, cliffs of Dover are made up of coccolithophores that were deposited on the ocean floor, uh, settled down through burial processes, were, were pushed down, right, and turned into this structure that you see in front of you. Uh, this happened about 100 million years ago, and then tectonic activity uh, pushed up or uplifted this uh, section here up to expose it. What's kind of interesting, I mean, think about this. This Think about, make a connection with the carbon cycle. This is carbon. This is carbon in rock form, right? Uh, and it's permanently sequestered pretty much right here. Now listen, acid rain can fall. Very small amounts of acid rain will dissolve the CaCO3, the calcium carbonate, uh, so that as it dissolves, it will probably get back into the ocean someday, right? But it's kind of interesting to think about that. That is right there, a carbon sink. It's a carbon reservoir, rocks. Interesting. 
There's more to the story about coccolithophores. Uh, take a look. The coccolithophores help in regulating the temperature of the oceans. Uh, how do they do that? They thrive in warm seas, and uh, when they live, they produce this chemical called dimethyl sulfide, sulfide into the air. And what that chemical helps to do is produce thicker clouds. So think about this for a minute, right? We talked about this in terms of the greenhouse effect. Clouds, these white clouds in our world, like the picture that you're seeing on your screen, are, are reflect sunlight back up into space. And that means that if light is reflected back into space, it's not being absorbed by Earth. If it's not being absorbed by Earth, it won't re-radiate re out that warmth to be captured by those greenhouse gases because the light is being reflected. So greenhouse effect doesn't happen as a result, right? So what do you think might happen then to, uh, to our world if the coccolithophores were to decrease, right? If ocean acidification removed some of these from our system, we'd probably have less of this chemical secreted into the air and therefore we probably wouldn't have as many clouds. If we don't have as many reflectors, up in our atmosphere, that means more sun insulation will hit our earth and warm it up, right? So reducing the abundance of coccolithophores, scientists believe, could reduce cloud cover over the ocean and help to contribute global warming even more, enhancing that greenhouse effect as a result. Kind of interesting. One reason why we should uh, ensure that we, we reduce the instances of ocean acidification, right? Because think about this, if something happened to the base of this food web down here, right? If we were to remove or reduce some of these individuals, we might have profound effects, either direct or indirect, on all the composition of the rest of these organisms within this community, right? Uh, potentially. So I'm gonna do a quick experiment here. Uh, take a look at the research question. How does an increase in acid in a solution affect marine calcifiers that make calcium carbonate shells and skeletons. So you might wonder to yourself, what steps could you take to test this out? Let me uh, pull up my my camera here, if I could. Right. So think about what we could do. We could uh, actually have some shells here. <laughs> These shells are made up of calcium carbonate, right here. Uh, let me focus that for us. Make it look a little bit better. There we go. Yeah. These shells uh, were were made by some creature a long time ago, a couple years ago probably. Uh, and they're made out of calcium carbonate. And so think about what we could do if we wanted to see what effect acid would have on these. Uh, well, we can measure the mass, right? The before mass of these. We can put them into, a couple of them, into a cup. And uh, we can put an acid into it, right? I've got some uh, white vinegar here. White vinegar has a pH less than seven, and so it is acidic. It's a weak acid, but Take a look here, I'll put them in. What we can do is actually allow these, uh, these shells to react for a couple days and come back, dry them out, measure the end mass, and look to see how much that acid impacted. And if you're looking very carefully, uh, you can actually see, let's let that focus in and out just a little bit as it tries to figure out where the bottom is. There it goes. Uh, you, you see that the, there it goes. You see the, the bubbles, the bubbles are, you know what it is? It's carbon dioxide, right? We're right now the acid, the H plus ions in this acid are stealing the carbonate from the calcium carbonate and, and uh, or rather in releasing that uh, carbonate back up into the air. It's exchanging out of this liquid up into our atmosphere as we speak. But most importantly, what we're doing is we're, we are eroding the shells. Now, this would never happen in our world. We'll, we're never going to, to like have a ocean that is so acidic that it's literally making sea shells bubble like what you're seeing on the screen. What will happen though, is that it will reduce the number of carbonate available to these marine calcifiers, reducing the size and the number of the abundance. And that can have profound impacts on the entire food web. Reduce the food and you reduce all of the other organisms too, or change those relationships. Uh, kind of interesting stuff. So I hope you guys got something out of that and it was helpful.